Welcome everybody, uh, Lailani here. Thank you for spending uh, your lunchtime with us. Um, there are many people attending the webinar from lots of different industries, including utilities, uh, consulting, retail, property, local and state government, and education providers. Many of you, I'm sure, have substantial location and investment decisions to make and want confidence in the data you are relying on to, form your to inform your choices. We have 30 minutes to make you all experts in what population forecasts are available and how to select the right one for your particular needs. Our aim is to help you build the best evidence base for your critical decisions without agenda or bias. If you have specific questions, please send them through, we, either now um, or by email. We may not have time to answer them all in the live webinar, but we will send through a list of all the questions and answers with the slides. If you would like to talk through your own unique requirements with one of our demographic experts, there will be an opportunity to request a consultation at the end of this session. Knowing how the population will change is extremely valuable for any organisation planning for its future. It's particularly important for organisations making decisions about when and where to locate their facilities and services. To inform your plans and make confident decisions, you will need to rely on a population forecast. However, it can be challenging to find a reliable source of data that al aligns with your particular business objectives. There are many forecasts available, produced by different organisations for various purposes. They use different assumptions, different methodologies, and provide different outputs. So we're he here to help you through that minefield. And we've simplified it into 10 things that you need to know about the forecasts. And we'll go through each of these one by one. So a good place to start is with a comprehensive list of all of the forecasts that you have to choose from. The forecasts are typically categorized as large area or small area, depending on their granularity. In Australia, the organisations creating forecasts are the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Federal, Tre Federal Treasury who produce national projections. These are for federal budget allocations and electoral boundary allocations. They will tell you about the size of the Australian population, but little about where the population will be distributed beyond the states. The ABS do produce a more granular set of forecasts for the Department of Health and Ageing called the National Aged Care Data Clearinghouse. Bit of a mouthful. Uh, they produce a national set of projections for each SA2 in Australia. However, we have quite serious reservations about their accuracy, and we'll talk more, a bit more about this later. State projections are produced by state governments, usually the planning department, um, and they're for allocating state government funds across the state. Each state is a little different in how they go about doing this, so it's not always easy to combine them into one national set. Local government forecasts are produced to assist local governments allocate resources to different neighbourhoods within their jurisdiction. By far the most common producer of local government forecasters is ourselves, ID. We produce forecasts for 130 councils under the name of Forecast ID. Councils that subscribe to Forecast ID generally make the forecasts available for free to the public via their website, hence you can access them too. The final set of forecasts available are micro geography forecasts. These are small area, this is something we call small area forecast information, and it's a set of independent forecasts produced by ID for each state. They're designed for organisations who need more detailed forecast information than is available from the public sources listed above, and they are available for all of Victoria, New South Wales, the ACT and WA, with Queensland coming soon. It's important to know if the geography that the forecasts are produced for will meet your business needs. The more granular the forecasts are, the more needs they can meet. Forecast Nirvana would be a set of national forecasts produced at a very granular level. This currently doesn't exist. Uh, at ID, we are working hard to achieve this, but until we do, it's a question of knowing what you can get from the forecasts that are available. So let's start with national projections. They generate a total population for Australia, 
and then they allocate it to each state by capital city and rest of state. They have limited usefulness for people making location decisions within each state. So then we come to state government forecasts. They traditionally produce a projection for the state and then allocate it to each local government area, or LGA. This is useful for broad resource allocation, but not so useful if you're trying to decide where you should be located within an LGA. Sometimes people try to cut the state forecasts up into smaller areas to match their catchments. They normally do this based on the current population distribution or land area. This is not a good idea if you value accuracy, as it disregards future changes in distribution, which can differ markedly across the LGA at different times. You should note that in Queensland, WA and Victoria, the state government forecasts are produced for smaller geographies. And again, we'll talk more about that later. So now we come to local government forecasts. So local government engages ID to produce their forecasts. The council decides which geographic areas they want the forecasts for. Mostly they're for gazetted suburbs or combinations of these because these are geographies that the community recognises. They differ from standard ABS geographies. And that was a question that someone asked um, before we started. The benefit of these forecasts is that they are a fairly, for a fairly small geog geographic area. Councils make them freely available for others to use, which is very generous of them. And the downside is that not every council has one, which can leave a hole in your analysis. SAFI forecasts start with the smallest geographic area that it is feasible to do a forecast for. This is an area of about 1,000 people. To put this in perspective, in Victoria, there are 79 LGAs, 430 SA2s, which are similar to suburbs, and 7,185 SAFI areas. The benefit of microgeography is that you can take these building blocks and create any catchment you want. You can cross suburb boundaries, you can cross LGA boundaries. SAFI is designed specifically for network and location planning, and I'll just reiterate, it's available for the whole of Victoria, or the whole of New South Wales, the whole of WA and the ACT at this very granular microgeography. We're currently working on a set for Queensland. So once you know whether the forecast is going to meet your geographic needs, Next, it's important to know if the time period covered by the forecasts will tie, tie in with your planning horizon. Forecasts are conventionally produced for five-year intervals. SAFI and Forecast ID are produced for single years, which is important if your investments are time critical. If you are planning to build a retail outlet in a growth area, the difference in population between three years and five years can be substantial and a forecast with a five-year time horizon may not be accurate enough for your needs. To resolve this, some people try to cut five-year forecasts into single years by assuming consistent growth each year. This is definitely not a good idea, as it doesn't match the reality of population growth, which can fluctuate enormously each year, depending on where and when dwellings are built to house the population. What about outputs? So not all forecasts make the same outputs available. It's important that you can find a measure that closely mirrors your target population. This is a comprehensive list of what can be made available. In general, small area forecasts provide more detailed outputs, such as single year of age, as opposed to five year cohorts. Um, and we've prepared a table summarising which forecasts include which outputs, and I'll come to that shortly. Once you've identified a forecast which can provide the data you need, there are a few quick checks you need to do on the quality of the forecasts, starting with a check on the commencement year. No forecast is set and forget. There are two things to check here. When did the forecast commence? Any forecast with the first year earlier than 2011 should be treated with caution. 
And how often are they reviewed? The more often the forecasts are reviewed, the better. This allows for a measured and regular review of the assumptions. I'm afraid a discussion of methodology can't be avoided, um, but I'll try and keep it to the essentials. So forecasters take the population in the base year and apply assumptions to work out the future population. There are two main kinds of assumptions. There are demographic assumptions and land use assumptions. Most forecasts, regardless of their level of detail, use the cohort component method for the demographic assumptions. The level of detail in the land use assumptions varies substantially between large area and small area forecasts. So let's start with the demographic assumptions. Forecasters make assumptions about births, deaths and migration. This is to come up with the total population figure that they then need to distribute. Different assumptions can lead to very different results. For example, the Victorian state projections published in 2012, known as Victoria in Future, assumed a long-term net overseas migration into Australia of 180,000 people. And this was quite high relative to uh, previous forecasts. As a result, it projected Victoria would reach a population of 8.7 million by 2051. In fact, migration peaked in 2009 at 300,000. So they were well under. An updated version released in 2014 assumed net overseas migration to Australia of around 250,000 each year. Under this set of assumptions, the population of Victoria was projected to reach 10 million by 2051. Currently, overseas migration is sitting around 150,000 for 2015, so it looks like an overcorrection might have been at play here. This is not to criticise the government's forecasters, but just to say that it's important to know what the assumptions are so you can make a call about how they are tracking. It also illustrates the importance of regular forecast updates. And we've put together a detailed reference guide which includes the major assumptions for every available forecast um, along with their outputs. So you can download the ebook to access those. The other main assumptions involve land use. How the future population will be distributed is, de is, is determined by how we use land. In a fast-growing country like Australia, the critical thing determining where the population will live is where the houses are being built and the jobs located. Large area forecasts use a top-down distribution. They take the, the overall population figure is generated, say at the national or the state level, and then distributed to the next geography down based on historical migration and broad assumptions about land use. For example, greenfield areas will generally be given a greater allocation than infill areas. There is a limit to how much, how small a geography you can distribute to using a top-down method with any accuracy. And this is the reason that we have reservations about the SA2 level projections Produced using a top-down method by the National Area, uh, the National Aged Care Clearinghouse, um, and we do recommend using those with caution. We've had a good look at their land use assumptions um, and have found quite a few fairly obvious um, errors in them. Here's an example of the kind of information that a top-down forecast would consider. So this is a precinct structure plan for Melbourne. You can see the growth areas um, highlighted um, with their PSP status. Um, and you can see that Wyndham, Meltham, Hume and Whittlesea would be allocated larger shares of the population based on their ability to generate more housing. Small area forecasts such as Forecast ID and SAFI flip this model on its head. They start with the smallest area and build up to larger areas. Each small area is scrutinised for its ability to generate housing. The amount and type of housing determines its future population size. Extremely detailed development assumptions are made that, that about exactly what type of housing will be developed and in which small areas. And this includes things such as major development sites, for example, converting industrial lands to residential lands, high density unit development, residential infill, greenfield sites and 
that kind of tricky little number, acti activity centre development. And it's this attention to the land use assumptions that facilitates greater accuracy in the forecasts. And in this example, you can see the level of detail upon which the forecasts are built. Here we've got um, Carnegie in Melbourne, um, and you can see each individual development has been identified and timed out across the forecast period. The other thing you probably want to consider when you're looking at your forecast is how independent they are. And knowing the purpose of each forecast helps you to evaluate any likely agenda that they may reflect. Treasury forecasts, for example, make assumptions that generate a bias towards a much older population, reflecting the government's rhetoric about the ageing of the baby boomers. In a similar way, state government forecasts will reflect their current policy focus. SAFI is independent from political agendas or aspirations, as it is built on evidence from the bottom up. How much should I pay? Always the, <laughs> the important question. And of course the answer really is it depends. National and state government forecasts are generally freely, are freely available, uh, but they may lack the detail required. Investing in time to cut them down into smaller areas is expensive and lacks and leads to serious inaccuracies. Local government forecasts are funded by each council who make them publicly available. Use these if they cover the areas you are looking you are working in. You don't need a statewide perspective and you don't need to work in many areas at once. SAFI is a huge project undertaken independently at ID by 10 full-time forecasters for which we charge a fee for service. It makes sense for organisations who are making decisions across multiple geographic areas, require their own catchments and detailed outputs, and who are making critical investment decisions. So which one is right for me? Um, as you can see, there are quite a number of things to consider. Um, so we've put a table together which considers um, the key ones for you to help, to help you sort of simplify that process. So you can see the forecast providers are across the top and the geography and outputs are down the side. So let's work through an example. Um, we have a client who is an aged care provider. And they operate in Victoria, uh, Tasmania, South Australia and New South Wales and they're looking to expand into Queensland. They need forecasts in Queensland for people aged 65 plus for each suburb across the state so they can identify the best investment opportunities. We recommended that they use the Queensland state government forecasts because they provide statewide coverage by SA2, which is close enough to suburb, with forecasts every five years, and we can use five-year age groups to build up our required 65 plus cohort. Let's look at another example at the other end of the age spectrum. Our client, the Department of Education in Victoria, needs to forecast the demand for each of their primary and secondary schools across Victoria. They need whole of state forecasts, and the obvious choice would seem to be the Victorian state government forecasts. However, they need forecasts for every year of age from 4 to 19 years, so they can demand, forecast the demand for each year level. They need a forecast for every year rather than every five years so they can time the movement of children through the year levels. Each school plans for enrolments from within its catchment. These can be smaller than suburbs, especially primary schools, so they'll need to build them up out of smaller building blocks. They also need to time the development of new schools on the urban fringe. And SAFI, really the only forecast that meets all those requirements. In fact, we built SAFI to meet the needs of organisations like this who are doing highly specific place-based planning with a need for both a macro view across the state and a micro view of site-specific locations. It's particularly important for age-based services and in fact, on this list you can see the whole age spectrum, spectrum represented here from schools through to aged care and right eventually at the other end of the spectrum to cemeteries. 
Um, not something most of us like to think about, but they need to plan their locations and their land use too. But to sum all of this up, we thought that we'd show you some forecasts in action based on the Department of Education example. So let's start, so we're looking at Victoria, so we'll start at the state level and let's look at the demand for primary schools in 2015. So we need five to 11 year olds. We'll have everybody. Um, and we'll just start by looking at the current position, which actually is a forecast. Um, and obviously there are more children, 378,000 in the capital city than there are in the rest of the state at 127,000 primary school aged children. So let's start to have a look at what happens when we get more granular forecasting information. So now you can see we're looking at um, regional information and you can see that we've got sort of neck and neck in terms of number of children, 68,000 approximately in both Wyndham and, um, oh sorry, in the southeast and the, and the west. So let's zoom in a bit more, gave the game away. So now we're looking at forecasts for local government area geography. And here you can see that in fact, Casey um, has the largest number of children, 29, nearly 30,000. And the next one down is Wyndham with 21, 22,000 children. So there's been a lot um, talked, well, a lot of focus on Wyndham of late, so we'll zoom in and have a look at that. And as we go in a little bit further, we're now looking at SA2 geography, which is kind of like a suburb. Um, and you can see that within Wyndham, Point Cook has the greatest number of primary school age kids. And how, is it, how well is it serviced with schools? So now we can compare the demand with the supply. And if we zoom in a little further, you can see that in fact Point Cook has four schools and presumably, in fact I know, each of them has their own catchment. So knowing the number for the whole of Point Cook, 5,500, isn't particularly useful for individual school planning. It's a starting point, but we need more detail. So this is where SAFI really um, comes into its own. And you can see that we've put the geography on over the, the map. And these are the areas that we're forecasting with SAFI. And when we put the forecasts on, you can see that we have much more granular information. And you can see that the schools in Point Cook seem to be pretty well placed for the current situation. Um, and you can also see that you could build each of those areas up into a catchment for that school. So the other thing that I notice when I look at that map is obviously the kids are pretty well located um, south of Tarnit, a railway line. Um, so the development hasn't really headed north of that line um, in any great number yet. But what happens into the future? Um, and there are no schools over there either at this point. So we're going to look between, we're going to look at change, just pure change in the number of primary school aged children in the next five years. And what you can see is you can just start to see some other areas coming into the picture and we can start seeing the area around the station um, now has, how many kids is that? About 100. And we'll go another five years out. And by 2025, we're really starting to see a, a significant increase in the number of kids um, on the northern side of the railway line that have reached primary school age. Um, people aren't really, don't travel very far to primary schools, so we're really needing to start planning for schools in those areas. It's only 10 years away. Um, and it would be helpful if we could look at some catchment information. So we're going to add some of those smaller geographies together to create a possible catchment for a primary school. And then look at the numbers that it produces.
So we're looking, we're going to look 2015 to 2025. And you can see the catchment outlined there, and then you can see the forecast age structure. So you can actually see all the different age groups there in 2015, and then how they change out to 2025. And you can see our five to 11 year old group will have grown by 903 children to a total of 908. So we started off a base of five and we'll have 908 children out there by 2025. So we're talking about at least one primary school, if not, and, and in fact, um, we're talking two. So just going back to the map, um, I'll just, we just want to show again what would happen if you didn't have access to that level of detailed information. So in many states, um, in some states, you might get down to SA2 level information. So you'd been doing your planning based on that kind of geography. Um, and in other states, you're talking about only having access to LGA level geography, which means you'd be making your planning decisions with one number for that whole area highlighted in red. So if you're making an important decision, detailed forecasts are a very cost-effective way of getting more confidence in the decision that you're making and reducing your risk. So finally, we've put some resources together for you. Um, there's an ebook, uh, which this seminar is a summary of, if you like. Um, and this includes a detailed reference guide um, of all of the assumptions, outputs, um, and methodologies used in each forecast that we've discussed. Um, for those of you that are really interested in evaluating the difference between forecast ID and SAFI, which are ID's two small area forecasts, we've written quite a detailed blog on this subject. I know our friends over at Essential Economics would probably be interested in that. Um, if you want to access the forecast ID sites, You'll find them all together in one spot at the Demographic Resource Centre on ID's website. And finally, if you'd really just like someone to talk to about all of this, because it is quite complicated, um, we'd be very happy to speak with you about your particular situation and recommend the best forecast for you to use. It won't necessarily uh, be ours. It may be that you can you know, use some of the, the free resources available and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction. Of course, the forecast data is only one part of the story when it comes to investment decisions. How you then use it, combine it with other data and communicate the results will determine your success. But that's a story for a whole nother webinar.